according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. I want us to think today about the church uh, and what exactly the church is. Um, and so to begin, just want you to, when, when you hear the word church, take note of what memories or um, images come to mind for you. Um, I think for many of us, when we think of church, it will be of a place of a particular um, congregation, perhaps from our lives. Maybe it's the church we grew up in. Maybe it's, you know, St. Luke's or Good Shepherd is what immediately comes to mind for you. Or maybe it's a church that you spent much time in uh, when you were a child um, with family and so forth. Um, maybe it's none of those things. Maybe it's an experience that you've had by being part of the church. But just kind of take note of that within yourself of what comes to mind for you when you hear the word church. For example, and I think I've shared this story. I know I've shared it before. I just don't know if I've shared it with, um, with all of you. But when I think, when I hear the word church, uh, and especially when I think of like um, my childhood, one of the images that comes to mind for me is of uh, a movie theater. When I was in my first grade, my family belonged to a church. Uh, we joined a church when we moved to uh, a town in Texas called Denton, Denton, Texas. Um, and the church had suffered a fire sometime before we moved there. And when we joined this church, the new building was being built. And in the meantime, they were worshiping in a movie theater. And it wasn't just any movie. It was, and don't think of the movie theaters like we have today, you know, the multiplex, ginormous, big movie theaters, you know, um, in shopping malls and things like that. This is one of those old time movie theaters in a small town built probably in the 20s or 30s. It was on, uh, you know, some of you are old enough to remember these. I mean, well, no, all of you are old enough to remember these movie theaters. <laughs> the most, remember these old movie theaters? They were usually either on the main street of a town, or in this case, they were on the town square. Often on the towns, old, you know, towns were built on a kind of a square grid, and there would be a center of the town maybe a courthouse or some other government building on this in the center 
and then a, a square where there were, you know, local businesses. And this old movie theater was on that town square. And um, so it was a single screen movie theater. It was old, it was dark. It had, it, your feet stuck to the floor. <laughs> the chairs were uncomfortable. Um, and there was an incredible slope to the aisles, you know, going. So I just, what I remember, this is one of my earliest memories of church, is going into this old movie theater and running up and down the aisles, which were, I guess, a, quite a slope, um, but sort of the auditorium seating, the stickiness of the floors and the darkness in this building, because no matter how much they, they, you know, tried to light it up, it was a movie theater. There were no windows. There was no daylight getting in there. Um, why that memory has stuck with me all these years, I don't, I don't know. Because I've, I've been in lots of other churches since then. I've pastored lots of other churches since then. I've been in cathedrals. I've been in modern buildings. I've been in all sorts of churches. But that old movie theater experience is what sticks with me. And I don't think it's so much the movie theater experience itself as it was what I saw happening around me with the adults. Um, they were together as a, as a community. My parents came along and joined this community, um, but they had suffered, like I said at the beginning of the story, they had had a fire. Their church building had burned to the ground. And, you know, nobody was crazy, I can't imagine. I don't imagine anyone was crazy about worshiping in that old movie theater. But there was a camaraderie, there was a a sense of community that they shared. Um, and when the new building was ready and they were able to move back in or move into the new building, um, there was just a, a, a strength of community. Um, so much so that when years, well, some years later, when I returned to that town to go to college for a couple of my years of school, I went back to that church and I hadn't been there since I was about seven years old. And people remembered me as if I had walked out of the door, the, as if my family had left yesterday. They remembered me, the same pastor was there. He even offered me a job eventually, working part-time as a, a youth minister. And it was in that experience that I really heard my calling to go into ordained ministry and go to seminary. It all started in an old movie theater. Church, what do you think of? Today's readings, um, especially those from the New Testament, from Romans and um, the Gospel of Matthew, speak to the nature and the identity of the church. The story in the gospel is a somewhat familiar story, and it is a, um, a key story in the gospels, one in which the church itself looked to as sort of its foundational um, story, the, the, the story from which they, the church, the early Christian church could point to and say, that's where it started. That's the moment. That's the conversation that Jesus had with Peter and the disciples that laid the groundwork, the foundation for what would become the, the church. And as with so many things, um, it started with a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And you heard the reading 
just a moment ago. They give him all kinds of responses, different prophets, some, uh, some of the Old Testament prophets, some saying John the Baptist, etc. And Jesus listens to this for a moment because we can't imagine that he didn't already know who people were saying that he is. But he did want to know what the disciples said, whether the disciples were paying attention to all of this. And then he turns a phrase and switches the emphasis, uh, drills down a little closer to home. Okay, fine, that's who people say that I am, but who do you, who do you say that I am? And in one small turn of phrase from who do people say that the Son of Man is to who do you say that I am, he identifies himself as Son of Man and he gives them a moment to respond and to step up. It is, of course, Peter who, as he so often did, speaks really for the group. But we get a sense from the, um, the, the sort of passion in, in Peter's words that Peter's not simply speaking for the group, but that he's also speaking from his own heart and for himself of answering that question as only he, Peter, could answer it. And whether or not his comrades and the other disciples would have answered the same way, he didn't really, uh, he doesn't really care. He's going on record right here and now to say who he thinks Jesus is. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's a bold statement to, to go from this conversation about, well, people say you're Elijah, some people say you're John the Baptist, some Jeremiah, et cetera, et cetera, to Peter dismissing all of that talk of what people say and claiming this bold statement for himself and I think for the, the rest of the disciples too as to Jesus's identity as the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, indeed, we can see why the church then, from then on, would see this moment as foundational um, Peter, of course, you know, Peter's not his given name. His name, given name was Simon, Simon's son of uh, John. Um, excuse me, Simon, son of Jonah. Um, Jesus gives him this, he gives him this new name, Peter, or, and there's this play on word, Peter, Petros, uh, and rock Petras. And so Jesus says to Peter, the rock, Rocky, if you will, it is on, it is on you, Peter, that I will build my church. It is on your confession of faith, Peter, in this, uh, in this moment that I begin something new and I build my church. There has long been sort of a di difference of understanding about what is meant by on this rock. Is it referencing Peter specifically uh, as our uh, more Catholic minded brethren would contend that Peter himself the person was a foundational reality on which the church was built. And then uh, those who would succeed him in the office of Bishop of Rome um, would remain as foundational. Or was it this expression of faith that Peter articulates that becomes the foundation? I, you know, 
Can it be both? I mean, I think it can. Um, I think there is something significant about Peter, the person. Historically, we know uh, he didn't just continue to talk a good talk. He walked a good walk. He gave his very life for the church, and his witness became foundational. And the faith that he articulates here and would continue to faith, likewise, became foundational. All that came after him, all apostles, all pastors, all people of faith who could just as boldly as Peter say, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. Anyone, including you and me, who articulates that faith, articulates the foundation on which the church exists. And it is the church that uh, Jesus says uh, has this unique place to be found in the life of the world. Um, and he uses language, Jesus does, to, to sort of describe this in a way that does, it may not be real clear to us today. And he says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Some of you that have been coming on Wednesday evenings will recall we had this reading a couple weeks ago. We talked about binding and loosing um, a couple Wednesdays back. Um, binding and loosing was actually sort of a um, kind of legal terminology, if you will, if you will. Um, it, it can refer to um, rules or laws that are by which people are bound, or it can refer to the exceptions to those rules or laws by which people are loosed or freed from. It can uh, refer to the process by which one is uh, excommunicated from a community like the church, um, in which excommunication is imposed or lifted. So it has this very sort of, it can even refer to uh, forgiveness of sins or the lack of forgiveness of sins, binding and loosing. The way I described it a couple of weeks back, some of you recall, is to think of it as if, um, well, to use the imagery of a rock, as long as we're talking about Peter today, think of a rock about as, it's about as bound of a substance as you can get. It's just, it's solid. It's, it's not free. Whereas something that's loosed is more, it is free. It's, it's fluid. It's, it's open. So the idea being that a church that binds is a church that is bound. And a church that looses is a church that is free. Church, and the, the, the word, familiar word you may know, the ecclesia is the word that's used in the gospels in Greek to talk about church is a gathering simply, a gathering of people. The church was, the church is the ecclesia. So a church that is bound is a church that is almost, you think of it as almost like frozen. You hear phrases like the frozen chosen. Uh, that's the idea of, of being bound. Impermeable, unable, unwilling to, um, to open up to others and to change. You don't get much more bound up than a rock. But the church has the capacity and has since the beginning to not simply be bound, to not simply be legalistic, but to also be loosed 
and too loose. And that, and here's the great promise that Jesus gives to Peter and to the church, that whatever we bind or loose on earth is bound and loosed in heaven, that there is a correlation between things earthly and things heavenly, that there is a correlation between who we are and who God is, that God stands with us, God stands behind us, God has our back, if you will. It is this intimate correlation between the divine reality and the human reality that is initiated in the foundation of the church. And so we hear then these words from Paul. I encourage you to hear these words from Paul then in the Romans reading in that light of the divine earthly connection. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ. We, who are many, are one body in Christ. Earlier on in that passage from Romans, Paul exhorts the Romans to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed in the renewing of their minds. We who are many are one body, one body transformed by the renewing of our minds in God. Right there, it's like it's hiding in plain sight. We have been given that which gives us the ability to be church. We have been given the ability to be one, to be found to be a people in unity of spirit. When people walk into a church building or get on a Zoom church phone call, video call, how are they to know? How are any of us to know that we are in fact not two dozen separate people, but one people? one body. Ultimately, it boils down to how we live together. How we go about being the church together. Do we live bound like a rock, or do we live loosed and free upon the rock? I would contend that what Jesus wanted for Peter and the, and the disciples, and what he wants for you and me today, is to not be rocks so much as to live from the rock to be a people that open their hearts and their transformed minds wide open to recognize that which has been given to us. Jesus uses this beautiful image of a set of keys and a, a, the keys of the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Will we live using those keys to keep things locked up? Or will we use those keys 
to unlock things, to open wide this mystical body, the body of Christ of which we each have a part. One of the beautiful things about this way of doing church right now as and I've told you, I'm, I'm just as tired of Zoom church as all of you. But this ability to look at all of you at one time and see you together at one time, in one place, on one screen, listening to my one set of ramblings, I tell you what, it reminds me that we are the church that we have each been given a set of keys. The doors have been opened wide to the kingdom and we are the body, the mystical body of Christ, one in him. The doors open wide to all people. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.